Morning, everybody. Dr. Gillard here once again. It is Wednesday, and this is spring 2020, still week one. This is the second video on spinal anatomy, and here we go. Hope everybody's doing well and is safe and healthy. And we talked about the coccyx last time. Let's talk about the sacrum. Right, this is a 3D reconstructed view of the pelvis shows the sacrum really nicely and there it is it even shows the coccyx which we talked about yesterday and yep there it is so it's a triangular shaped bone and it's jammed in between the two coxal bones right uh, lay people call those the hips i mean really the hips are down here uh, but coxal bones you can also call them the ossa coxae or anominate bones i prefer coxal bones but there it is it's also, just like the lumbar spine, it's composed of five sacral segments. They're really vertebrae when you start out as a little little dude. And they fuse into one block as you get older. And you can see it progressively narrow, so it's kind of like, a, like an upside-down triangle. And it forms the posterior wall, posterior superior wall of the pelvic cavity. Kind of looked at that pelvic cavity view last time. We'll see it again. Like the coccyx, it also has a base and an apex, and its base articulates with L5. Its apex articulates with the base of the coccyx. Remember we said yesterday how it's, how it's kind of weird. Let's go back to it. Uh, so here's its base. Its apex is down here. Let me see if my drawing tools are working. Yep. So there's its apex and here's its base remember we said that's all kind of weird same with the, tr the coccyx right its base is kind of up in the air and its apex is down below and you would that's kind of weird right triangle you would think the base is on the ground on the base the floor uh, but that's not the way it is right here's an upside down view there's the sacrum back here cross section through it or an axial view remember the aka's for that for an axial view, chat, cross-sectional for the C, horizontal for the H, axial for the A, transverse for the T. We hardly ever use transverse. Sometimes you see it in anatomy. But anyway, uh, here's the pelvic cavity from this overhead view, uh, the symphys pubis. You're probably starting to learn some of these terms in gross anatomy now. Pubic tubercles, that's always confusing, right? Let's fix that or let's help you with that. In case you're having trouble uh, so pubic tubercles are always on the outside right? I always think of these as volcanoes pubic tubercles are here and then the lava flows this way toward the sea pubic symphysis is the sea lava flows toward the sea these are the pubic crests sometimes they're difficult to see on the on the bones oh by the way uh, speaking of gross anatomy, I used to teach that. Probably still will teach that in the, the big class in the fall. Uh, but I do have videos on all the bones, if you haven't discovered those, for gross 2 and for gross 1 anatomy. Uh, so go look on my main page. Just, go, just Google Gillard Anatomy. My YouTube videos will pop up for that main, uh, my main YouTube page. And you'll have to kind of dig them out, but they're down there ways with I have videos on all of the bones from the from the skull all the way down to the tip of the toe. All right, so that's the pelvic cavity. But anyway, here's our sacrum and you can see it makes up the posterior wall here. Okay, anything else I need to say about that? I don't think so. Right, so it's dorsal service. So what's dorsal? Is that anterior or posterior? Dorsal is an AK for posterior, so it's posterior service surfaces, uh, kyphotic or convex, and its ventral surface or its anterior surface is concave. Lateral surface articulates with the coxal bones again. Specifically, uh, there's two auricular surfaces. You're learning about the auricular surface of the ilium right now in gross one or you will be really shortly 
but there's an auricular surface of the sacrum on its lateral surface where the two connect together. And in fact, there is cartoon of its auricular surface. We'll expound upon that as we go through this. And yeah, so this is the front here. So it's concave in the front and it's convex in the back and the curve is said to be kyphotic. There's a nice view. Anybody remember? Oh, I guess I kind of blew it there, didn't I? I was going to say, what are those little horns called? Those are the coccygeal cornua and the sacral cornua and the inter cornual ligaments not shown, but remember that connects those two. And that's what helps hold the coccyx to the apex of the sacrum. All right, so here's a cross-sectional view or horizontal view. A cut right through the S1, it looks like, maybe S2, uh, of a very fresh cadaver. Our cadavers aren't nearly this fresh. Uh, but just goes to show you, there is the sacroiliac joint. So here is the sacrum meeting the ilium here. And we'll learn that the actual joint, let's see, kind of liking my colors this morning. So the actual sacroiliac joint is right here in the front. This is actually, there's some inter, uh, there's some ligaments very strong ligaments that connect the sacrum to the ilium here. And we'll talk about those when the time comes. Uh, so this is actually the SI joint right here itself. And this is just made the posterior uh, where, where, the S, where the SI joint, still kind of considered the SI joint, but it's mainly ligaments back here. The synovium is up here in the front of the SI joint. Right, and there's the body of S1. And look at that, you can see some of the nerve roots. We're gonna talk about these in a little while. Get everybody up to speed on these things. Okay, sacrovertebral bodies. So just like the rest of the spine, and we are gonna, we're gonna do kind of a fall in a rabbit hole in a minute. Uh, but just like the rest of the spine, the sacrum is originally made up of bodies, vertebral bodies. I mean, it's a modified vertebrae is what the sacrum is. And there's five of them. I showed two here on this picture. Uh, but there is the sacral vertebral body of S1. And there's a posterior arch. It's kind of a little weird looking on the back. We'll look at that here in a minute. S2 would be here. Three, four, and five would be down below. Sacral vertebral bodies start out with an inner vertebral disc between them. So there would be a little disc space right here. If you were five years old, you would have a real cartilaginous disc here. But as you get older, it degenerates away, and calcifies, and kind of fuses into bone. But you can still see some ridges right here where this used to be. I got a slide on that though, and I tried not to get ahead of my slides. Right, sacral vertebral bodies start out with the inner vertebral disc between them. They calcify, degenerate away, uh, and leave something called the transverse line or transverse ridge. Right, so that star in this one definitely that's, and these these words, I mean, these are a chiropractor's vocabulary, right? So, and anybody else who wants to be a spine surgeon or any physiatrist, you got to know these words like the back of your hand. This is your vocabulary. Uh, Kramer also reverses, calls them linea transversaria. So watch out for that. You can usually decipher that if you saw that on test. Uh, that's common in anatomy to kind of flip things backwards and make it kind of more into a Latin type word. It means the same thing. So here's a full sacrum. We're looking from the front, an A to P view of the sacrum. You can see the five sacral bodies here front of the sacrum is really easy. It's nice and smooth. There's not too much going on. We'll look at these anterior sacral frame in here in a little bit. Uh, but you can see where the discs used to be in this specimen. And now they're all calcified. And those are the transverse ridges or transverse lines. Right? On the midterm, maybe I can stick a number on here. Number one. What is number one? It's a transverse ridge or transverse line. 
Okay, the anterior sacral foramen, these holes right here, look at the real ones. <clears throat> Be careful because there's posterior ones as well back here. But these, here's the anterior sacral foramen. These are the holes in the front. These are the posterior. I really like this little drawing program. Free program too, I forgot the name of it though. Those are the posterior ones back there. These are the anterior sacral foramen. Right, <clears throat> so we have some, some nerves coming out of these. Uh, so these are actually the anterior or ventral rami, or if you plural or singular is ramus. Uh, so these are the, the anterior ventral rami or the ventral rami or whatever. I like to use ventral, but you can use either one of these. Ventral rami of the sacrospinal nerve coming out of here. Uh, these are real important. S1, that's a member, well, you tell me. Probably a kinesiology person out there. What is that a member of? Something very famous. You're going to treat tons of patients with the inflammation of that nerve right there. What is that? That goes into, makes up part of the sciatic nerve. And L5, uh, um, the most common type of disc herniation is a paracentral disc herniation of L5 can compress the S1 nerve root. Let's see can compress the S S1 nerve root right about here. The disc would be here, the L5 disc. And if you got a herniation posteriorly, the S1 nerve root, which is usually already out of the thecal sac, and we're, got it, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. And then this guy would be on fire, a patient would have horrible leg pain. All right. Uh, we talked about the, the the S5 sacral foramen, remember, oh, this cartoon's, no, this cartoon is correct. But there's five sacral nerves. There's five sacral segments and five sacral nerves. Where's the, where's the S5 nerve? Remember, that comes out from a makeshift hole right down here. Remember, there's the lateral sacral coccygeal ligament. And the nerve pops right out of here. That ligament goes like that. Remember that thing? We talked about that. And here it is, right here. Uh, so you have a kind of a makeshift sacral foramen, S5 sacral foramen, made by the lateral sacrococcygeal ligament. And yeah, there it is. Um, yep. And yep, we got all that stuff covered. All right, now we're going to fall down one of my dreaded rabbit holes here. Uh, so we, I mean, it's hard putting these things together because some of these topics overlap and you can't just go perfectly in order because I'm already saying things like nerve root and we haven't really talked about nerve root. I've talked about a superior articular process and you're like, what the heck? Some of you might have no clue what that is. So we need to fall down a rabbit hole. Excuse me for my little water break, so I'm not going to be able to cut these out. I'm gonna, my voice has got a long way to go today. Tomorrow I think I have six hours of lecture, so I'm not too worried about today, but tomorrow's going to be a tough one. All right, so uh, I could, I should have put a star here. Heck, I could put a, put a star here right now. I should have put like ten stars here. This stuff you absolutely have to know. Uh, so this is a run-of-the-mill vertebrae. Uh, this is actually a cervical vertebrae we're using here. But the principle applies to the thoracic lumbar, and some of this applies to the sacrum as well. Uh, even the coccyx a little bit applies. Uh, so there's two parts. A vertebrae has two parts. It has a vertebral body, which is right here. right, And then it has something called a a vertebral arch. You want to call it the posterior arch. Some people call it that, but you shouldn't. Posterior arch is reserved for the very top bone atlas. So let's call it the vertebral arch. And the vertebral arch is made up of several parts. We have a pedicle, which I probably should have used a regular vertebrate. The pedicle is a little weird in the cervical, but this is a pedicle. This is part of the articular pillar right here. 
and then this is the lamina right here and then this is the root of the spinous process right and then the structures repeat over here but you can see we've made an, a ring of bone haven't we we made a ring of bone so what well we have a ring of bone something needs protection and that something will be the spinal cord in the cervical thoracic spine and very upper lumbar spine there's no spinal cord in the lumbar spine right uh, there is a bunch of nerve roots traversing nerve roots that hang in a sack uh, those traversing nerve roots are called the horse's tail hint good cauda equina cauda equina right so that's the story with that uh, we can also look at another hole we're going to talk about uh, and it's a little weird in the in the cervical spine it's angled obliquely angled forward we'll talk about this specifically when we get to the cervical after the midterm but there's another hole right here and that's called the inner vertebral foramen or the neural foramen or the IVF we'll talk about that more probably getting ahead of my slides all right so the arch of bone creates a hole and that's called the vertebral foramen if you put two bones together you have yourself the vertebral canal another misnomer don't call it the central canal uh, some authors call it the central canal and that's bad because the central canal is a hole inside the spinal cord itself where cerebral spinal fluid can bubble through so vertebral canal right through this in here put this slide together last night got my bones all set up right next to me here uh, so I'm adding to these PowerPoints a lot while I have this extra time traded it for my commute time uh, so you can see the cervical vertebrae are smaller they're a little weirdly shaped the transverse processes are double strutted right there's the anterior strut stand ring calls it the anterior bar so I like strut but maybe you really should call it bar I guess because that's the board book uh, there's the posterior bar anterior bar intertubercular lamella we'll get to this stuff it's got a weird hole there that's for your vertebral artery uh, so yeah spinous process sticks straight out the back on this one this is c7 probably maybe c6 some some are bifid I, I don't want to teach you the cervical spine we'll get to that uh, but the point is there is the vertebral foramen right there this is a thoracic vertebrae transverse processes are stubby the spinous process is is angled downward you can't really tell by this we'll get to that when the time comes but there's its vertebral frame and lumbar spine is lumbar vertebrae is much bigger and transverse processes stick straight out like airplane wings uh, and yeah there's its vertebral frame as well okay and yeah the sacrum I had to tip the sacrum down on my table and took a shot right down the center and sure enough it's got a a vertebral canal running through it there are vertebral foramen that's one vertebral foramen s2 vertebral foramen s3 vertebral foramen etc they all make up the vertebral canal don't we in this region we call it the sacral canal instead of the vertebral canal but it's still part of the vertebral canal very cool picture right here there's the base of s1 we'll get to that stuff okay another bony hole kind of spilled the beans already the neural foramen uh, chiropractors tend to call it the inner vertebral foramen medical doctors tend to call it or medical students tend to call it, and medical doctors the neural foramen uh, radiologists are medical doctors they tend to call it the neural foramen as well uh, we tend to call it the intervertebral foramen or the IVF so I use these three t uh, terms interchangeably so here you can put these on a note card and you need to know these uh, so this is a hole from the side this is where spinal nerves come out of the spine we've all seen those little rubber spines right with the or those little plastic spines that have those yellow things coming out 
Those are spinal nerves that come out there. It's created by, well, you could say it's created two ways. It's created by something called the pedicle of the bone above and the pedicle of the bone below. But you can get more specific because the pedicle uh, has a some notches in it to create these holes. And there's a superior vertebral notch and an invertebral, inferior vertebral notch. And the superior vertebral notch is off the inferior vertebrae of the motion segment. And the superior vertebrae contains the inferior vertebral notch. So it's a little a little tricky there. You have to be careful when you're taking a test. So pictures are always best, right? Let's look at some pictures here. Um, so here we have a, and did I tell you what a motion segment is? I'm not sure. I think I left that out. So I should tell you, what is the functional unit of the spine? That's right. It's called the motion segment. You can write that in. I definitely won't be doing too much of this writing. But a motion segment is a, let's say this is L3. You can switch to, let's change colors. Motion segment is the vertebrae above, the disc in the middle, and the vertebrae below. That's a motion segment. But how do you name that? That's the L3 slash 4 motion segment. Sometimes you go out to lunch with a spine surgeon or a physiatrist or someone you're going to work with. Uh, they might call that the L3 level. The L3 level. When they say that, they're talking about the L3, the L3 disc, the intervertebral disc, which we haven't come to yet, but there's a disc in here. We'll, know, we'll get to know all about the disc. The disc is always named by the bone that sits on top of it and conquers it. So motion segment is the top member, uh, adjacent vertebrae, the, its disc, and the vertebrae below. So that's a motion segment. Are we all good with that? So the reason I put this in here, uh, I can show you the pedicle right here. That's the pedicle, strongest part of bone. We have this transverse process, this airplane wing. Now this is coming out of the plane of the page, so you have to imagine that. Um, but then we have, and you can see the superior vertebral notch better. You can see it right here. See that little dip? So that's the superior notch, and this is the inferior notch vertebral notches and then I have them labeled right here so we have inferior vertebral notches right here superior vertebral notch is right here the intervertebral foramen or the neuroframen is right here you can actually see the other one a little peak of the other one over here okay are we good with that pretty simple concept all right the pedicle I just showed you here's an overhead view uh, kind of hard to see the superior vertebral notch from this view, but you can sure see the pedicle better than we could see it. I had to draw it on the cervical spine, uh, but there is the pedicle right there. It, the pedicle is what connects the vertebral arch to the vertebral body. That's the strongest part of bone. You push, put this thing in a vise and crush it, which piece of bone crushes the last? It would be this pedicle is super strong. Okay, I think we got all that. This is a famous picture here. You have to know this. This should be on your refrigerator or wherever. You have to know these parts like the back of your hand. Why do you have to know these parts? Well, you'll have an x-ray to take, or you'll have a license to take x-ray when you get out of here. And your job, especially if you charge for it, you have to if someone has a fracture, you have to be able to communicate via an x-ray report. And what if the what if the patient's fracture is right through here? 
you have to be able to say the patient has a fracture through the right lamina of, we'll say L4, we'll call this, of L4. Uh, or they have a, a fracture through the superior articular process of L4, a fracture through the pedicle. Or they have a fracture through the pars interarticularis. A couple times a year you have a patient with that. That's really common, especially in high school athletes, pars fractures and maybe even slips. We'll talk about that this quarter. So that's why you got to know this stuff. So it's not a waste of time. You'll take this slide with you forever. So this is a vertebrae. It's exploded, so it's a cartoon, right? It's not really like this in the body. I had a student come to my office all concerned. How can this be in the, the body like this? I don't understand. This is a cartoon, right? So you, it's not like this in the body. We've seen what these look like. So, but it's it's nice because it helps you understand this. So let's go through this. So this is the vertebral body. Specifically, you could call this the bony end plate, uh, the superior vertebral bony end plate, if you will. But we'll get to that. We'll get deeper as we get into this. But for now, let's call this the vertebral body. This is the vertebral body as well. Okay. There's a growth center. In embryology will probably get to this about how the the bone is formed. Right? So this is where the growth occurs. That's called the ring apothesis, number two. Ring apothesis. Uh, number three, we know these guys already. These are the pedicles. So, But more specifically, this is the superior vertebral notch. This is the inferior vertebral notch. Okay, got that down. We know what this hole in the middle, that's the vertebral foramen. Uh, let's do this. Let's talk about this thing. This is, you could call this the articular pillar. I guess you're not, you're supposed to call it the articular pillar for sure in the cervical spine, maybe not so in the lumbar spine, but it looks like a pillar on CT, so I still like to call it the articular pillar throughout the spine. And it's a column of bone. And in the middle of the column, just underneath the pedicle where the pedicle connects to this there is a really weak region and that is very important that's called the pars interarticularis we call it the pars for short but you guys call it the pars interarticularis uh, you will get this again and again and again as you go through the program remember we said the pedicle is the strongest part of the bone guess where the weakest part of the bone is right here and you can get fractures of that pars interarticularis. We'll look at some real cases of mine, and we'll, we'll see fractures. And we, we can even see slips. Sometimes the pedicles in the vertebral body can slip forward if this is fractured. Uh, that's called the spondylolisthesis. Um, but yeah, that's the pars interarticularis. So what else can we do with the pars interarticularis? The bone, the part of the articular pillar above that, is called the superior articular process superior articular process. The part of the bone below all of this is called the inferior articular process. Got it? Now, this is not correct. We shouldn't be able to see this white stuff here. That should be the same color. I didn't have time to fix that. Um, but on this one, because these face inward, you can see a little pad, a smooth area on the bone. And it's still the superior articular process, but there's a cartilaginous pad in vivo in a, in a real human. But you can still, in the cadaver bone, you can still see this smooth pad. And that is called a facet. So a facet, a facet is simply a round piece of articular cartilage. It's smooth. And that's where it would articulate with the inferior articular process of the bone above. So the superior articular process and the inferior articular process form the zygapothecial joint or the Z joint. Unfortunately, in the world, we call this the facet joint, which is a terrible term because you have these little pads of articular cartilage which are usually covered with a synovial membrane. and you have those all over the body. You'll look at those in the tibial plateau has them, 
uh, the inferior end of the tibiohasm. They're everywhere, these little pads of cartilage. Um, so those are called facets or articular pads of articular cartilage. Um, so when when we're studying, and I'll show you when we lab next week, I'll do a little demo, I'll show you these things. And make sure you call that the facet of the superior articular process. There'll be one on the bottom, which is on the back of this we can't see. There'll be a facet of the inferior articular process. Uh, so that's an important concept. All right, so number 10 is the facet of the superior articular process. Some people call them the superior articular facet. I mean, I really couldn't mark it wrong if you call it that, but I prefer that you, if you say facet of the superior articular process, I know that you know that is, that's the joint, that's the articular cartilage uh, that in vivo would have a synovial membrane around it and filled with synovial fluid, a real joint. All right, enough said. Did I get everything? Kind of got rambling, and I think I did. We got the... Uh, one more concept. Uh, so you might hear roof of the vertebral canal. The roof of the vertebral canal, if this is a house, there's the roof. So the lamina make up the roof. Another concept. So the spinous process right here, uh, it sticks to the back of the lamina. Some authors say that the spinous process actually meets here in the middle. So some people say, the some authors say, that the spinous process makes up the root or makes up the roof of the vertebral uh, canal or vertebral foramen if we're looking at one. Uh, some people don't. So that's kind of, if I was writing a board question on that, I would stay away from that because the authors don't agree. All right, so super low. Look at all the stars, right? That looks like fifth quarter. It's even worse than fifth quarter. There's stars everywhere. All right, so now we should talk about a little bit of neural anatomy. We're still falling down. We're actually going down a double rabbit hole. This is another rabbit hole. Uh, but uh, so what we just talked about these holes, vertebral foramen and the neural foramen. What do they do? So we need to learn a little neural anatomy right now so we can understand what they do. So their job is protection. A bony hole is for protection. They protect the spinal cord. They protect the exiting spinal nerve roots. So it's time to do some neural anatomy. So what's the spinal cord? What's the spinal nerve roots? Uh, well, these are two important parts of the central nervous system. Remember, there's a PNS and a CNS. Central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord, but we can't forget that we still have some nerve roots hanging within the the neural foramen or within the vertebral canal. So that's also part of the central nervous system. So two parts, brain and spinal cord. The brain is like the main computer right up in your head, constantly receiving messages, constantly processing these messages from the environment or from your own body. And then your brain decides what What's, what is it going to do about these messages? Maybe nothing. Uh, maybe it needs to itch. Maybe it needs to itch your patella. Or maybe it needs to go for a walk. Uh, so the brain, the brain carries out its commands via a whole bunch of telephone wires. Uh, there, of course, are the axon is kind of like a wire. And that's the very basic. You'll learn in neurology about the components of the nerve and how they work. Uh, but uh, the brain is the master computer of the body. It lives inside the skull. We'll be looking at the skull a little bit. You'll be looking at the skull a lot next quarter. But it lives up inside the head. Here's a sagittal, mid-sagittal slice through the noodle here. So there's your brain there. There's your cerebellum here. The I should show you this right now to start getting your brains used to it. Uh, there's an area right here. You see how the the occiput stops right here, and the occiput stops right here. There's a big hole right here. Let's make that in red. There's a nice hole right here. That's called the foramen magnum, and there's a hole in the bottom of the skull. And oh look, here's your spinal cord, right, which we're going to look at here in a second. Uh, there's the pons, part of the brain stem, medulla, 
uh, it goes through the foramen magnum. Uh, so your your spinal cord is connected to your brain via this foramen magnum. So that's an important important concept there. Uh, but here's a picture of the noodle. So we'll get into these parts later. Um, but here's the spinal cord. The spi where's the spinal cord born? Right here, right as it goes through the foramen magnum. Okay, everybody got it? It's the main electro, everything I kind of said, it's the main electrical wire, connects the uh, brain, the, the main electrical wire uh, that connects the brain to the whole body is the spinal cord. It's like a gigantic trunk. Look how big it is. It's like massive, right? The only thing that big, there is a nerve you're going to study really quickly. The sciatic nerve is that big, huge, uh, but this is humongous. Right, uh, so yep, got that. Spinal cord leaves the foramen magnum. The spinal cord travels all the way down to about the L1 disc level. So L1-ish, L2 is where the spinal cord terminates. That's kind of a problem, right? Because our spine goes all the way down to the coccyx and the, the vertebral canal goes all the way down into the sacrum. So what's the deal with that? Well, during development, it gets left behind, so it's short. Uh, but anyway, I'm digressing. The end of the spinal cord comes to like a tip, and that end of the spinal cord, here's one for your note cards, conus medullaris. That's the tip of the spinal cord, conus medullaris. Here's just a cartoon. You'll get a lot more of this, and you, we're not going to get into the gray matter here and the white matter on the outside, but... Here's the noodle, here's the brain, and here's the spinal cord. And yeah, it goes all the way down to the coccygeal part of the spinal cord. The weird thing is this coccygeal part of the spinal cord, that's about at the level of T1 or L1. Uh, so this drawing isn't the greatest, right? It's kind of makes it look like it goes all the way down to the coccyx, but it doesn't, as we'll see in a minute. There's some enlargement here. There's a cervical lumbar enlargement. We'll let the, I think Dr. Musavi is still teaching that, so we'll let him explain that stuff to you. Here's some fun facts. Good good little brain. I'm not a big one with memorizing numbers, but here's one you got to memorize. So, and we, we need to talk about this first. So at each level, so right, the brain is communicating. How's the brain going to communicate with just one wire here? There's the spinal cord. Well, at every level, every neural foramen has a spinal nerve coming out of it. And you can see all the spinal nerves. And they go down to the tip of your finger and down to your toes, and they go all over the place. Uh, but the point, the fun fact point is, there's actually 31 spinal nerves, pairs of spinal nerves. So 62 spinal nerves, but they're paired, so there's 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So they match the number of bones in the spine. There's 12 spinal nerves. Thoracic spine, there's five in the lumbar spine. There's only one in the coccygeal region, but there's an extra one here in the cervical spine. So there's actually eight pairs of spinal nerves uh, that come out of seven holes. So the first one comes over the top of the posterior arch of atlas. The second one goes underneath through the IVF of atlas and axis. So the first one's got two uh, up here. So C1's a little special. All right, we'll probably look at that more when we get to the cervical region. The other com important part is here, uh, these C2, C3, C4, T5, T6, T7, T8, T12, these nerves, they have them drawn like wires here, but they're not wires. They're actually embedded in the substance of the spinal cord. They live in areas. If anybody who's, probably a lot of you have already studied this, but there's tracks that are that live in the gray matter, and there's tracks that live uh, in the white matter out here. Um, so a little different. There's no wire here. But when you get down below the conus medullaris, so here's the conus right here. See how it's starting to become triangular and shaped? Um, after this level, 
the nerves, I mean, they have to, there's the L5 intervertebral foramen is down here. So the nerve actually comes out way up here. Actually, the lumbar is way up here. It comes out at the level of L1-ish, T12-ish. And that wire has to hang all the way down and go out the IVF down here. So it's a different setup down here. There really are, these are called traversing nerve roots. There are no traversing nerve roots in the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar spine. The only place you ever see these traversing nerve roots is in the cauda equina. Traversing nerve roots make up the cauda equina. Okay. Everything I said, let's take another look at it here. So there's another cartoon. There is the end of the spinal cord. So that would be the conus medullaris. Should be up a little higher. Usually it stops at between L1 and L2. They have it down to L2, so that's okay. I mean, I have some clients that comes all the way down here to L3. Some clients I have it way up there at T11, so it's variable. Um, but now you can see the end of it. So here we have all the nerve roots coming out, going out their holes, going out the because they have to penetrate the sac. We need to talk about this sac too. Let's do that right now. We'll hit it again when the when the time comes. But you see there's a sac right here. Right? It's split open so we can see, but normally it would be completely closed by a sac. Uh, this is called the dural sac or thecal sac. And this is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. If you poke a hole in this, cerebral spinal fluid will leak out. Cerebral spinal fluid is like a river of fluid flowing. It nourishes all the components of the spinal cord and all of these traversing nerve roots. It's very important. Uh, the Warriors coach, was that two years ago? What's his name? Steve Kerr, is it? Not a super big basketball fan, but uh, he had a procedure. He had a, I believe it was an epidural steroid injection, and they poked a hole. They went a little too far and poked a hole in his dural sac, a.k.a. for that is thecal sac, and he got cerebral spinal fluid leaking out causes horrible, horrible headaches until this is fixed because you're leaking fluid. So he was actually missed a couple games because of, actually he missed a couple weeks, I think, because of a dural headache. He had a leak of cerebral spinal fluid. So it's really important when they do spine surgery uh, to be careful. And they, all the time, they nick it and rip the dura and get a dural leak and they have a patch. They can patch it. There's fibrin glue. They can glue it. They, uh, but sometimes it's really tough to treat. Uh, so I'm digressing again. But anyway, that's the thecal sac. Thecal sac runs all the way down to S2, and it connects up to the foramen magnum. But anyway, for this slide, I just got way ahead of my slides, uh, but that's the conus medullaris. There's also something I will talk about later. I didn't talk about in this presentation, but this thing, the phylum terminale. There's a phylum terminale interna that's inside, right in the middle of the thecal sac, and then it actually rips out down here at the bottom and continues down. That's the phylum terminale externa, and it connects down into the back of the coccyx. Uh, um, so that's the phylum terminale. What is the phylum terminale? And I'll hit this again. Um, but anybody wonder why there's four coccygeal segments, but there's only one coccygeal nerve, nerve root? Well, if you do histological sampling on this phylum terminale, it turns out that there's remnants of the, the second, third, and fourth coccygeal uh, roots that are mixed in with this. This is covered by arachnoid mater as well, uh, but we'll get to that. Okay, I'm getting out of control. Let's get to the next one. So like branches of the tree, two nerve roots leave the spinal cord uh, at each level, and they exit through the neural foramen. And we kind of looked at that, but here's a nice view. This is a PDA view. Here's the noodle up here, brain. Here's the skull, foramen magnum is right here. Spinal cord is going down like this. Uh, and down here in the upper thoracic spine, you can see you can see the nerve roots leaving. The IVF would be right here. Here's the pedicles cut. The IVF um, would be right here, the neural foramen. And you can see the nerve roots drop down a hair and they come right out their hole and they go out and do their job. 
there's a uh, we'll see we'll look more at the anatomy of this in a minute. Uh, but yeah, this is a really nice little uh, cartoon here or model, I guess this is, of how the nerve roots are born and come out of the IVFs. And yeah, so that's pretty cool. That happens all the way down. And what else did I want to say? Yeah, once they go out through the hole, peripheral nervous system is born right here. Central nervous system, this is still, uh, this is the, there's actually a sensory nerve root and a dorsal nerve root come together to form a spinal nerve root right about here. Spinal nerve root is part of the peripheral nervous system because it's outside of the neural foramen. Okay, that's the story with that. Everything I said, uh, but this is an important concept. We've kind of been talking about this. So nerve root descent. So when the nerve roots, go back to this, when the nerve roots are born, see there's the spinal cord, the nerve root pops out. Well, let's see, look down here where you can see. So right here, nerve root is born. And you can't see, but there's two of them. There's a sensory and motor nerve root. So when they're, this is the spinal cord level right here. Okay, that's where they enter. And we'll, you, we'll study that. You'll study that as you go through neurology. But they drop down a hair, and then they go right out there neural foramen. So their vertical drop is not much. But remember, down in the lumbar spine, the vertical drop is tremendous. They have to hang and go a long way is the point of that. And they're a little more vulnerable when they're hanging down. So now going back to the slide, once the nerve roots emerge, uh, they travel varying distances before they reach the neural foramen. Uh, the lumbar sacrum coccygeal in particular, they travel great vertical distances before they come out. They're vulnerable uh, during that, that hang time, I guess. And it's not true with the cervical or upper thoracic spine, as we just showed you. They don't drop very much. Cervical don't drop hardly at all. They come out and go right out their hole. So that's the point to that. But down, this is a really nice model in the lumbar spine. There's the conus medullaris. And let's go down to L5. So here's a pedicle cut. This is a P to A view. Here's the um, the sacrum is cut right here. And we can see the L5 nerve root. The L5 spinal nerve is born right here. It's going to be part of the sciatic nerve. But where is its spinal cord level? It's not right here. There's no spinal cord. You would think, we just saw up in the upper thoracic spine, how the nerve roots come out and they drop a tiny bit and they go out their hole and do their job. That's not the case down here. These guys have to go, let's follow it. Still following, still following, still following, still following. It goes all the way up here to T12, T1-ish. So its level is right here. This is the spinal cord level for L5. Crazy, isn't it? Why the committee designed it like this is a mystery. Uh, but nevertheless, this is got the spinal cord got left behind in embryological development, and so we created a new structure, and that's the horse's tail. This is a really nice model. And there's the sacrum, sacral canal way down there. Uh, who are these? Guys, these are called traversing nerve roots. Traversing nerve roots. Right? I think everything I said right there, so that's nice. We're starting to understand this, I hope. Uh, the thecal sac we talked about, but let's, let's put it in stone. Remember, when I write my midterm and final, I won't ever ask you a question unless it's in stone here. Uh, so some things you're going to get later. You can take some notes on here. But if I didn't, if it's not in writing here, I won't ask it to you. I won't ask it, unless I specifically would say something. Uh, but I don't. It comes right from these slides. So thecal sac, so spinal cord and cauda equina, are submerged in a slow-flowing fluid-contained sac called the thecal sac or the dural sac. What's the fluid in there? We already said cerebrospinal fluid. Right, thecal sac is around the cervical uh, spinal cord and the thoracic spinal cord. 
Uh, so it's definitely around. And I'm just looking at my time here. That's right. I have no clock on the wall to look at. I don't want to overbomb your brains here. Um, but yeah, so we talked about that a little bit already. Uh, in the lumbar spine, but it's in the cervical spine too, but there's because the spinal cord is in there, it's a little harder to see. In the lumbar spine, it's super easy to see. In fact, there's a procedure that you can order if you have to uh, called a CT myelogram. And you in, you, you stick, you in very carefully, you poke a needle in here, pierce the dura, hope it doesn't leak too much, and you inject a contrast inside the thecal sac. Contrast glows white on uh, CT and on fluoroscopy. And then you have a nice outline of the thecal sac. Maybe this guy's got a herniated disc right here. Well, it would show as a fill defect here. You'd see a black area in the, in the thecal sac. Those are called fill defects. And we don't really order those because of, I mean, you can see these on MRI. But the nerve root sleeves, when the nerves, uh, when the nerves bud off like this and then go out, the contrast fills up the nerve root sleeve as well. And so you can see MRI sometimes misses little herniations that are far lateral. You can see compression of the nerve root in a CT myelogram where sometimes it's missed on MRI point here. Anybody see? I'm digressing a lot. I don't want to make this too long. Anybody see anything weird? We talked about spondylolisthesis and pars intraarticularis. So when you're looking at imaging, always check the corners, back corners of these bones. Those are pretty close, pretty close, right? This one might call it a retrolisthesis, but um, these are pretty close. And right, we should be able to draw a nice line through these, right? See the problem? What's going on here? Looks like L4 and L5. That might be a transitional segment, but yeah, we got a slip. So that's a spondylolisthesis. Uh, we have about a 20% slip. That's called a grade one spondylolisthesis. So they, if they either have a fracture of that pars intraarticularis and it's let the bone slip forward, or they have a degeneration of the, the zygopotheceal joints or the facet joints, uh, and that's caused the slip. It's called a degenerative spondylolisthesis. Digressing too much today. We'll get to that. I just noticed that right now. Um, thecal sac is made of two covers, so it's the outer covering is very tough, uh, tough mother, dura mater stands for. Notice that this is not matter, M-A-T-T-E-R. Uh, this is mater, dura mater means these are the tough uh, meninges, these are the coverings around the, the spinal cord and cauda equina. Uh, so it's underneath that, stuck to it, is the arachnoid mater. So what, what are the two layers of the thecal sac or dural sac? That would be tricky. What are the two layers of the dural sac? They're not going to say dural sac. That gives you the answer. They'll say thecal sac. What are the two layers of the thecal sac? Well, one's dura mater and the other's arachnoid mater, but not pia mater. Pia mater is wrapped around the spinal cord itself. It's stuck to the spinal cord. It's stuck to all the traversing nerve roots as well. Okay, contains tubospinal fluid. What are the contents of the thecal sac? That'd be a great question. Which one of the following is not a content of the thecal sac? Well, spinal cord, yep, thecal sac up higher. Cauda yep, traversing nerve roots, yep. Um, phylum terminale interna, yep, that's contained in there. I'm just kind of rattling these things off. Yeah, so those are all contained in the thecal sac. All right, another important concept. Now we're using back to the cervical again. Really nice drawing here that was uh, floating around on the internet. So very cool. Uh, but so we need to pin this stuff down a little bit more. So if you really look closely, this is the spinal cord itself. So what's the deal with these nerve roots? So there's specific names for these things. 
when and even before I go further, this is a spinal cord level or segment. Okay, so this all this is the property of C7. This is the property of C6. This is the property of C5. We're going to look at the C5 spinal cord level. So it's not just one nerve root that pops out of the spinal, uh, spinal cord. There's a segment, there's a little column that pops out. So all of these, these are called nerve rootlets. So we have anterior and posterior nerve rootlets. The posterior ones are always sensory. They carry signals from the periphery into your spinal cord and up to your brain. Scratch your fingers, signals going right down these things right here. Okay, um, so these are called nerve rootlets. The nerve rootlets morph into nerve roots. Specifically, we can call this the dorsal sensory nerve root, or you could just call it the dorsal nerve root. It's given uh, you know, that it's sensory. Uh, you can mix mash all these terms, so you, you could see it anyway. Uh, this is the motor root. These signals are heading this way. You want to scratch your nose, the signals are going down, or you want to scratch your, or you want to squeeze, you make a fist, the signals are going this direction. Okay, so this is the anterior root, or you could call it the motor root, or you could call it the ventral root. Now, this little bump is important. That's put on your flashcards. That's called the dorsal root ganglia. We haven't got this deep into it, but there's axons. There's wires traveling within these roots. And this is a little weird here. Uh, so if we could look inside here, we could see a, a wire coming like this, and it's going in here. But the brain of the nerve is called the cell body. The cell body actually lives right here. The cell body makes nutrients that are transmitted up and down the nerve root to keep it alive uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But these cell bodies live inside the dorsal root ganglion. Uh, so that's an important concept. On the motor roots, there's no cell. The cell body is inside the, inside the CNS, inside the spinal cord. Remember, the signals are going this way. These signals are going that way, right? So we'll come to that again, too, when we talk a little bit more about neurology. But now here's the next important concept. So right after the dorsal root ganglia, the neural foramen or the intervertebral foramen would be right here in most cases. That's the, I mean, that's the, now let me, let me draw that again. So the, the, the end of the neural foramen would be right here. So the neural foramen would go like this. Because the neural foramen almost, not always, but most of the time it protects the dorsal root ganglia. So once we pop out of that hole, the neural foramen, we have a new creation. This segment is called the spinal nerve, the spinal nerve, okay? Um, so this is, if this is C5 segment, this is the C5 spinal nerve. Spinal nerve is going to split uh, really quickly into a dorsal and a ventral rami. We'll talk about that. There's a gray ramus communicans, and we'll talk about that when the time comes. But for right now, that is the spinal nerve. That is a mixed nerve. There's the board question, right? Mixed nerve. These are not, these dorsal root and ventral root, those are not mixed nerves. These just have motor fiber. These just have sensory fiber. But right here, they're mixed together. And same, these are mixed nerve. The ventral rami, or dorsal rami and ventral nerve rami, these are mixed nerves. They have sensory and motor fibers. So spinal nerve, mixed nerve, you are no longer in the CNS, you are in the PNS. Good? Great. All right, let me see my time. I gotta actually meet with you guys here in a bit, 7.03.
too bad I don't remember when we started. Uh, let's see. Go a little bit further. We'll keep going. Right. And there's just all this labeled out for you. So sensory nerve rootlets, sensory nerve, motor nerve rootlets, motor nerve, dorsal root ganglia, spinal nerve, mixed nerve. Now you're in the PNS. Okay, here's a cadaver slice, really fresh cadaver. Uh, it shows the vertebral body of C6 and uh, the bone of C6. So these will be the C6 ventral nerve root. You can't really see the rootlets. They would be down below this. Uh, but you can see the dorsal root here. Dorsal root ganglia would be here. The intervertebral foramen would start right about here. Right, here's the hole for the vertebral artery, transverse foramen. Yeah, there's the spinal cord. There's the little H, right? Yeah, I don't want to digress too much, but there's the Z joint, the facet joint right there. Superior articular process is here, inferior articular process is here. You don't have to know that stuff. Cool picture, though. Got a YouTube video on this. A little deeper on cervical anatomy. Actually, we'll be coming to that, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, life beyond the IVF. I just told you about that. Uh, the spinal nerve is a mixed nerve. It splits quickly into dorsal and ventral rami. Some books call that. Let me, um, like even Kramer calls it. I think a dorsal primary rami. Uh, Gray's doesn't call it. I go with Gray's anatomy, and Snell doesn't call it that. So there's a split on what to actually call these. Uh, unfortunately, Kramer uh, is a board book, and Gray's is a board book. So which one they'll use is beyond me. Here's a really cool model showing the spinal cord. We've already looked at this, but these are the rootlets here, uh, number 17. So that'd be the ventral root or the motor root. Uh, you could call it the ventral spinal root. Don't you dare call this the spinal nerve, though. I see YouTube videos, and I see authors even calling these spine. These are not the spinal nerve. The spinal nerve is a mixed nerve, number 22. So don't uh, don't get those messed up. There's the dorsal root ganglia. Uh, yep, there's the motor root. And right here, these two blend together. The neural foramen is running about here, and it comes out. We talked about all this. Uh, this is the dorsal rami. Dorsal rami splits into a medial branch, which is super important. This medial branch actually has fiber that goes in to the zygapothecial joint or the facet joint, and it supplies it with proprioception as well as can transmit the signal of pain. If you get a messed up Z joint from a car accident or from whatever. Maybe you don't have good genetics. You don't have good genes. And this thing is always setting off pain. The pain comes through uh, this medial branch of the dorsal rami. So that's a lo that's a guarantee I'm going to test you on that. Uh, and we'll talk about that even more. There's another branch that goes to the multifidi muscle uh, above a segmental. So it doesn't take out the whole multifidi muscle, but takes out a piece of it. Uh, so that's also an important concept. Gray ramus communicantes is right here. Uh, you're studying, you're, you'll see the sympathetic chain in the lumbar spine. You'll probably see that next week, I would think, or the week after. Uh, but there's the gray ramus communicantes right there. There's the sympathetic uh, chain right there. There you go, another important picture. Um, yeah, okay, yay, we're out of the rabbit hole. Let's get back to the sacrum and finish this lecture out. Uh, sacrum is unique. It's got these holes. Actually, yeah, we'll go a little bit further. Um, so sacrum is unique with regard to holes. Uh, it has a neural foramen. We've looked at those sacral foramen. Um, but the holes are weird. So the whole reason I went down that rabbit hole is so you can understand the weirdness of the sacrum. So we talked about the anterior sacral foramen. I showed you quickly the posterior sacral foramen. Uh, this S5 sacral foramen is weird, right? But the wiring of the sacrum is weird. 
So the dorsal and ventral roots, uh, they leave the cauda equina and they merge with the spinal nerve, which is, there's nothing weird about that, within the sacral intervertebral frame, and nothing weird about that. But here's where it gets weird. It gets weird where they split into an anterior and ventral ramus because what I just showed you, the anterior and ventral ramus, they're not protected by any bone, right? There's the posterior or, or dorsal ramus. Here's the anterior ramus, number 20. There's no bone protecting them. There's no bony hole. The bony hole stops here. Stops right here is the end of the bony hole. That's not true in the sacrum. Uh, there's actually a bony hole that called the anterior and posterior sacral frame that we don't have, so they get extra protected. Therefore, it's pretty rare to have problems with those nerves because they're so protected. So let's look at the anatomy of this. So here's an overhead view through S2. Here's the bony hole, and the, the spinal nerve uh, would come out, would be born right about here, and it would split into a dorsal rami and ventral rami, and it's got extra protection is the point here. There's the anterior sacral foramen, which is deep, posterior sacral foramen, which is more shallow. And yeah, we put the nerves, a cartoon of the nerves in here. So yeah, especially the anterior ramus, it's got a lot of extra protection. <clears throat> My voice is starting to go. Okay, most parts of the anterior, most parts of the anterior sacrum vertebrae, or more parts. All right, so immediately lateral to the sacral body is a mass of bone uh, called the costal elements. Bogduke, which is a board book, calls it the bone bar. Uh, and so these are thought to be made from embryological rib buds, a rib tissue, which mesenchyme, which forms into rib. Um, so that's where they come from. We'll look at that in a minute. If you go lateral to that, there's lateral masses. Lateral masses of the sacrum are made from transverse process elements. So embryological tissue that usually grows transverse processes grows these weird spatulated transverse processes, and they melt together to form the lateral part of the sacrum. The lateral mass of S1 gets a special name called the ala. Picture's always better, right? Let's look at the picture. So here's that nice A to P view. Here's the S1 body. Well, let's do S2. S2 body. Between the transverse foramen, we have some fused costal elements here. So, or you can call it bone bar if you want. That's the region here. So this is the bone bar or, or FCE, fused costal elements. If you go lateral to the sacral foramen, this is called lateral mass. This is rudimentary transverse process. Right? Rudimentary transverse process, but you call it lateral mass. This is also the S1 lateral mass, but no one ever calls it that. That is actually the sacral ala. Sacral ala. Sacral prominatory, so if here's that anterior view we've been looking at. Transverse lines are right here, you can see. You can see just where these intersacral foramen are starting. Uh, so we have a lip here off the vertebral body of S1, uh, and that has a name. That's called the sacral promontory. Sacral promontory. If you get a dysplastic spondylolisthesis of L5, it won't slip off the cliff. It gives it a little extra room just to keep it on, but we're not exactly sure what the purpose of. But that it's handy in dysplastic spondylo. Okay, this is probably a good spot to stop because I actually got to go meet with you here in a second. Oh, actually, we'll st let's go one more. Uh, so the, there's muscle attachments. We've been talking about the anterior part of the sacrum. Iliacus, piriformis, coccygeus all attach to the anterior part of our, our sacrum here. And so iliacus would just attach up here to the sacral ala. So that's an attachment site. Piriformis would be the bone bar and lateral mass of S2, 3, and 4. But now you can see how piriformis attaches exactly. Um, yeah, coccygeus, kind of like iliacus, just a little bit down here of the lateral mass, down here of S4. 
is where that attaches. We also have transverse lines, but look at this weirdness. So we have a, a rudimentary disc that never quite fused here. So on MRI, that would look much more prominent, but they don't always weld together. This point. You see one anomaly, always look for more anomalies. All right, I think that's a good place to stop. Now I'm going to keep my fingers crossed and hope this video does not disappear like I had one disappear before. So Camtasia, please be good to us. So we'll see you in the next video.